Remember when this was uh, wireless technology? And this was mobile technology? Remember when this was a Kindle? And this was an iPod? When this was the cloud? And this was a search engine? This was Wikipedia? Remember when this was your news feed? When this was bill pay? When this was a photo album? And this was a text message? Remember when this was GPS? When this was social media? When this was your Facebook? When this was Instagram? When this was YouTube? When this was Netflix? And this was Match.com? <laughs> this is a photo taken outside the Vatican with the announcement of Pope Benedict in 2005. This is a photo taken outside the Vatican with the announcement of Pope Francis in 2013, just eight years later. I think we would all agree that the world is rapidly changing, and yet remember when this was a classroom? When this was curriculum? And this was a high school student? On a July evening in 1988, there was a disastrous explosion and fire aboard the Piper Alpha oil platform in the North Sea off the coast of Scotland. 167 crew members lost their lives. Of the 63 who survived, one was Andy Mochin, a superintendent on the rig. Asleep in his quarters, he was uh, awakened by an explosion, and even though he was badly injured, he escaped his quarters and made it to the platform's surface. And as he stood at the platform's edge and he looked behind him, the rig was engulfed in flames, and he knew if he stayed, he would die. But as he looked to the water some 15 stories below, there was twisted steel and other debris littering the surface, and flames had ignited from the oil on the water. Andy knew, even if he survived the fall, that it would only last a few minutes in the icy waters of the North Sea if he were not rescued. Still, Andy jumped. He survived the fall, and he was picked up by a rescue boat a few minutes later. In the hospital days later, he was asked about his experience, interview, what was he thinking as he stood upon the platform's edge? And his answer was a simple one. He said, it was either jump or fry. And so I jumped. And I would suggest to us that the American educational system is at a burning platform moment in history. Will we be courageous enough to jump or will we continue to do what we've always done, all but assuring the demise of our school system and taking with it the hopes and dreams of our children? If I were to ask you to name the first five presidents of the United States in order, there are some, probably a few, who would be able to answer correctly. You're likely a history buff or a Jeopardy champion. But if I were to ask you to name the first five presidents of the United States in order, and I gave you one minute to utilize whatever resources you have available to you, I would expect one minute from now everyone would be able to answer correctly. Because what would we all do? You would take out your phone and you would Google it. You would ask Siri, hey Siri, who are the first five presidents of the United States? So the question becomes, what's the more important skill in the 21st century, knowing the answer to this fourth grade history question or knowing how to find the answer? Because knowledge is doubling. In 1900, knowledge doubled every 100 years. By the end of World War II, it was every 25 years. Today, knowledge doubles every 18 months, and IBM estimates that the internet doubles every 12 hours. Yet we're convinced that we can summarize everything a student needs to know about a subject into a 200-page textbook to be memorized. Futurists tell us that 65% of the students in our current K-12 school system will do a job in the future that does not yet exist. And so when we say to our little ones like we love to do, hey, what do you want to be when you grow up? Two-thirds of them can't even dream about what the right answer might be for them. No, education in the 21st century has to stop asking, what do you want to be when you grow up? Instead, we have to begin asking, what problem do you want to solve? What new thing do you want to create? Because content knowledge was the economy of the 20th century's age of industrialism. But innovation is the economy of the 21st century's age of information. I would dare suggest that in the future for our students, the size of their paycheck will be directly proportional to the size of the problem that they can solve. You see, the three R's of education, reading, writing, and arithmetic, these served our nation well for many years. But it is not enough for today's students to simply be well-versed in the three R's. They must also be proficient in the four C's, critical thinking, creativity, communication, and collaboration. 
When employers are asked, what skills do you value most? What are you looking for in applicants of the future? They list things like complex problem solving, creativity, people management, emotional intelligence, cognitive flexibility. Yet how will students learn these skills sitting in a classroom of rows of desks taking notes while a teacher lectures at the front of the room? In what subject do students learn emotional intelligence? In what courses cognitive flexibility listed among the standards? In the age of innovation, our students must be imaginative and curious. They must be entrepreneurial and willing to take risks. Yet do our schools encourage risk-taking? Or is the expectation that students will learn what they're told, toe the line, and get it all right the first time? Do schools celebrate failure as a means of learning, or is it condemned as a sign of incompetence? You see, the outdated college prep factories of our current school system are producing graduates that educational author Rex Miller dubs well-schooled, poorly educated. 96% of academic provosts believe that college is effective in preparing graduates for the workplace, yet only 11% of employers hold this to be true. As a result, more than 50% of recent college graduates are either unemployed or underemployed, meaning they're either out of work or they're doing a job they could have done with a high school diploma. Now, from the beginning of time and for thousands of years, learning was an oral experience. It happened through dialogue, discovery, mentorship, and apprenticeship. But that changed around 1650 with the invention of the printing press. For the first time, words and ideas could be locked onto the page and the message could be separated from the messenger. This period unlocked one of the most prolific eras of innovation in human history. But in 1955, there was a new shift into the broadcast era with the invention of the television. But this era did not mark a radical shift in the delivery of education, but it did mark the time when students began to mentally check out on school. In 2005, we entered the digital connected learning era where students enjoyed serendipitous discovery and social interaction embedded in a media rich world. And then we fast forward to 2015, we're now in the social mobile and personalized learning era, an era that gives students amazing capabilities to personalize their learning all within a global network. So over the course of time, we have gone from life learning to content learning to experiential learning to collaborative learning to now discovery learning. The positions that we honor has gone from the elders to the experts to the personalities to the innovators to now the social entrepreneurs. Using a work metaphor, we've gone from the farm to the factory to the service industry to high tech to now free agency. That which we value most has gone from reliability to productivity to quality to creativity to now agility. And our collective memory has moved from the bard to the book to the documentary to the database to now Facebook. And so we are living in an era that is marked by discovery learning that honors social entrepreneurs, looks most like free agency, and values above all else agility and adaptability. The print era emphasized content learning in a factory system that honored experts, valued productivity, and stored its collective memory in books. Which one sounds like our schools today? I think that we would all agree that our current educational system is stuck in an era that ended in 1955. Or as Rex Miller notes, we are asking students to run a Google race in a Gutenberg-bound buggy. Now, we've been told that the answer to all of our educational issues, our woes, is better funding. Just spend more money. Yet over the past 50 years, we have tripled the amount of money spent on education. We're doing it with twice as many staff, and we haven't moved the needle on reading, math, and science scores. When parents are asked what's most important for effective schools, the overwhelming majority indicate that students must be engaged in their learning and hopeful about the future. Graduating high school, going to college, performing well on standardized tests rank much lower. And yet, what are schools designed to do today? to help students perform well on standardized tests so they can graduate from high school and go to college. And I guess if they're hopeful about their future and engaged in their learning, well, that's just a bonus. In the early years of our nation's history, the most common educational model was that of the one-room schoolhouse. This system was well-suited for preparing students for the predominantly agricultural economy of that era. But in 1893, a group of men known as the Committee of Ten transformed our schools into the complex system that it is today. 
You see, wealthy industrialists of that era saw the need for a new kind of uniform worker to fill factory jobs born out of the Industrial Revolution. And it worked. It was highly effective for more than half a century. But it is time for a new historical shift. Just as the one-room schoolhouse was an outdated model for preparing factory workers in the industrial era, our current school system is no longer adequate for preparing students for this new era of innovation. Now, critics will say that our educational system needs to be reformed. No, our current educational system needs to be reimagined. We need to stop trying to do things better and start doing better things. We need the same courage and conviction that our nation showed 125 years ago in transforming our educational system. We are standing upon the burning platform once again. For the sake of our children and our children's children, it is time to jump. Thank you.